Make sure to join us at Sam Houston Race Park on March 11th and 12th for Camel and Ostrich races. Also looking forward to March 26th, Texas Champions Day, including that NHC qualifier, $1,000 live bankroll entry fee. You keep what you have left at the end, must make five wagers of $200 a piece, plus bet half your bankroll in one of the last two races. Top two finishers receive all expenses paid trips to the National Horse Players Championship in Las Vegas in February of 2023. Make your way down to Houston and you may end up in Vegas. Welcome to the In The Money Players Podcast, Friday, March 11th edition, subbing for PTF. You've probably already noticed it's not PTF. It's me, Nick Tamaro, from the In The Money Media Network. Very excited to have three guests on board for today's program. We're going to cover racing from across the country. We're going to touch on some action out west, but we're going to get started with the Stakes Roundtable Focus with Matt Bernier. Matt, good morning. How you doing? Morning, Nick. Happy to uh, be chatting with you this morning. Again, PTF, hopefully he's enjoying his time over there uh, at Cheltenham. But we've got some good racing here stateside over the weekend, and I'm happy to be chatting with you about it. Yeah, I didn't realize that's where he went. I knew he went out of town. I should have figured it's it's as, as bourgeois a spring vacation as you could have. Maybe, I was going to say maybe I'm maybe I'm exposing something I shouldn't be. I believe he's over. No, there. no. I, well, no. It's it's quite <laughs> possible that he just didn't say it because he just forgot to. But um, doesn't matter. Glad to sub. Glad to be uh, in the mix and and happy to be discussing these races. It's a you know a little bit of a lull I think on the racing calendar. And our friends in Tampa may not necessarily love me saying that, but we had such a huge Saturday last week, which you've recapped on your show and we talked about uh, in many different outlets, but this is a little bit of a quiet, we've got a couple of quiet ones before we really get into the thick of uh, of derby prep season. We're going to cover three stakes races, you and I, two of them at Tampa Bay Downs, one of them at Oaklawn. We'll go ahead and go in post time order. I keep wanting to say post position order, post time order <laughs> and start with race eight, the challenger. We're going to look at dirt races primarily because at this point, I mean, we're roughly 27 hours before first post. It's looking like it could be a rough day weather wise. So we'll stick to the main track and start with race number eight, this is the Michelob Ultra Challenger. I believe this is the first time this race is being run as a graded event as well. It is a grade three at a mile and a 16th on the dirt. You know, Matt, one of my favorite segments, everything sports related, was Where Are They Now uh, that came up over the years. And this is kind of a Where Are They Now of good horses from 2021. And of course, I'm talking about Greatest Honor and Dynamic One, who both return off layoffs. Yeah, you know, Greatest Honor was sort of the bee's knees leading into the Florida Derby, and many people looked at him as a legitimate, viable candidate to win the Kentucky Derby, and unfortunately, he's been sidelined ever since, and as far as Dynamic One is concerned, you know, it seemed like he really blossomed last year at Saratoga, and then I thought, all things considered, maybe the final effort doesn't look all that great, but, you know, going up into the Travers may not have been the easiest spot for a horse like this. Big picture, they're two horses that have a great deal of promise. The problem is you're taking them off of lengthy layoffs. Granted, we know Todd's record off of lengthy layoffs. He usually has them cranked up and ready to roll. But I'd mentioned to you before we started taping, I, you know, I've, I was never the biggest, greatest honor fan. I think he's a little bit quirky. I think he's got things that you can poke holes in. Perhaps he'll put it all together as a four-year-old now. Maybe the, the maturation process you know, will do wonders for him. As far as dynamic one is concerned, though, I just, I don't know, he he gives off the impression to me that longer, a little bit on the grindy side, that maybe a mile and a 16th coming back off the bench at a track like Tampa is at a little bit sharp at a short price. So that led me to kind of look around for alternatives. The problem is I just didn't love any of the alternatives. You know, you go to the far outside, I, I kind of looked at those three horses, Scalding, Cody's Wish, Cheryl Spite, Cody's wish, I think he's a very consistent horse, but I don't know that a low 90 buyer is going to be good enough to get the job done in this race against these kind of horses. Scalding looked really good in that run at Tampa most recently. He was 3-4 path throughout, drew off pretty impressively. The runner-up came back and earned an 82 in the next start, so I think it just kind of firms up that fig that he earned. Again, I think he needs to improve. I, I suppose by default, I'll go with Cheryl Spite, simply because I think this horse has an immense amount of talent, and Maybe this one can't stand up on the main track. You know, he's only tried the dirt one time in this one's career. But that Tampa Bay effort, I thought, last out. I know it may have been a little bit of a subpar field, but really finished well. This is the you can tell why they rushed this horse along to run in the wood by mile and only the third lifetime start. The horse has an abundance of ability. Whether or not we can handle the dirt, whether or not the outside post is going to be any kind of an issue. You know, again, that remains to be seen. But I just don't love the two main players. And then the other two that we just talked about, I'm just fearful they're a little bit slow. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I and mean, Cody's wish is a horse I kind of wanted to be better than he ended up being. And he really has never taken a step forward, which is frustrating because he started off with a great deal of talent. He had those those bad trips to start his career in his first two starts. He was beaten on the square by Pipeline and Waxman, both of whom have turned out to be perfectly fine horses. Pipeline was a little over his head in the Cigar Mile later in the year. My sort of, of wild, uh, and it won't be that wild, but off the wall type of horse, especially if this track comes up wet as Wolfie's Dying a Ghost, who I've always felt like was a horse with some talent. He was the he was very atypical of what you'd expect from this female family, being a half to both Dinah Passer and more importantly, Sadler's Joy. This is a horse who's a ghost zapper, and he ended up being a dirt horse. And Tom Albertrani tried, and he eventually got him going on the synthetic last time out. He's clearly the speed to me. There's no doubt about it. I mean, he he should be loose in the opening stages. I suppose Paco Lopez gets to ride this race because it's a previously scheduled engagement. Um, this is his kind of horse, I would say, one that he should really put on the engine. And uh, and this horse, a sloppy track race back in July of last year at Belmont, was actually very good. That was a very, very strong pace. Now, granted, it was against considerably weaker horses. It was mainly uh, horses that were, were turf types meant to go on the grass, when, and it was taken off the turf. But he was one that I felt like would be a decent enough price. I don't really know if he'll be 10 to 1. I think with a with a 93 buyer fig from last time out, even on a synthetic surface with speed and Paco, he's going to take a, a good bit of support. I, I was I was stunned to see Cheryl Spite in this race. Um, you, you just figure by this point they would probably take their medicine and move on from dirt racing. But, you know, all things considered, perhaps that's a good sign. You know, when a trainer with the Roger Atfield's type of credentials tries something that it looks to the public like makes no sense, oftentimes it ends up playing out the exact opposite way. So I don't blame you for looking for a little bit of value. And again, dynamic one and greatest honor both horses that showed potential last year, but it is a, it's a tough situation to take greatest honor. And he is interestingly getting Lasix for the first time because our Lasix rules in America allow you to run on Lasix in certain graded stakes races, but <laughs> not all of them. So that is the Michelob ultra challenger, which goes as race number eight. The centerpiece of the Tampa Bay downs card is race number 11, the Tampa Bay Derby, which will go at five twenty three Eastern time. And Matt, we talked a little bit before we came on about this race. It looked, Looks like the classic Causeway show. Yeah, it really does. And that was why I mentioned to you, I, I hope you're a little more creative than I am. But I just thought his run in Sam F. Davis was really solid. Went out there, set honest fractions, buried the other speeds. Anybody that was remotely close to him finished up the track. And I don't want any of the horses that ran behind him coming out of that race in particular. Mm -hmm. And it'd be one thing if I thought there were real players that were sort of new shooters, fresh faces in this race. Uh, Major General, I guess, is fine. I, I never loved him last year as a two-year-old, and his Iroquois, the form of that race, looks a little bit suspect, to say the least. Um, but beyond that, I, I just had a hard time really getting too creative. Happy Boy Rocket, I suppose, will be one that'll draw a little bit of attention. This will be second time with the blinkers on, uh, first time out going two turns. He was wide throughout, and I thought he won rather impressively, but grand scheme of things, it was against inferior company. I thought the pace was on the more moderate side, and Gulfstream Park can be a little bit quirky as far as what ships and what doesn't. I just had a hard time getting past Classic Causeway. I think this is a race he's supposed to win. And if he does, he continues to kind of solidify that the idea that he is a legitimate threat to win a race like the Kentucky Derby. He does need to improve from a fig standpoint, but I, I think second off the bench, there's no reason to think he won't move forward. Right. And, you know, one of the things about the Sam Davis, as you alluded to, is that on paper, that race was packed with speed. I mean, it felt like a situation where a meltdown was imminent and he just went out and, and grabbed the basically took the air out of everybody else, going fast, getting the lead, forcing everybody else to chase him. And that's his talent. And I think that's why so many of us were frustrated when they tried to rate him in the Kentucky Jockey Club. And, and really, to be fair, he ran well in the Kentucky Jockey yep. Club. I think I was a little too critical of the ride, but I think losing to to smile happy that that night um given i think the quality that smile happy has shown and, and beating white barrio by open lengths shows that you know that was a solid field and a big effort so I, I my interesting underneath thought is to play an exacto over grantham and so I, I promise i'm not on the withers was actually a good race hype train but grantham <laughs> is a horse that was going he was going long on the dirt for the first time and you know i i can't stress enough and i know you you're a believer too in, in the time form us methodology that was a really, really strong pace. And, and I mean, the, the, the kind of pace that you just don't, to put it in perspective, we're talking about Classic Causeway setting a strong pace and running really well in the Sam Davis. Grantham's pace figures are almost the same. And the difference is Classic Causeway is a speed horse. Grantham's not. 
right? So I think he was put in such a difficult position. I don't love that he's going to be on the rail and, you know, Tampa is a little more dead rail-ish than anything else. We'll see what happens with the weather. That could mitigate things. But, you know, he's going to be 20 plus to one. And why not? We've already seen one Withers run back run well. I'm not going to put too much into Unoho's win in the Rebel. But still, that was kind of my thought. Because like you, I don't want any of the underneath types from the Sam Davis. I don't want Shipsational. I don't want Strike Hard. And I will make Major General proof to me that he's a better three-year-old than he was two-year-old. Do you have any opinion on Giant Game? Because he was a horse that I, I honestly I was a little bit blown away by the Breeders' Cup performance. I just didn't see it coming that far. That move on the far turn before he flattened out, came back in the Holy Bull and apparently uh, displaced. So you can kind of draw a line through that if that's actually what the story is. I mean, again, the Breeders' Cup juvenile form not great at this point, but we have seen a couple horses. Pinehurst, you know, say what you will about him. Overall, he did come back and win over in Saudi Arabia. I, I mean, what do you do with a horse like Giant Game? Is there any interest? It's hard to believe that there was a, a an excuse that was that ready, right? That he displays <laughs> that. But this question becomes, to be fair, and with due respect to the connections, I guess what what the question becomes is which was the aberration, right? Last yeah. time or the Breeders' Cup? And and that's and that's basically what you're saying. I thought he ran incredibly well in the Breeders' Cup. I was shocked at the top of the stretch. It looked like he was going to get a piece of it, and I had thought he was kind of a joke even being in there. So. I guess he deserves one more chance, second off the layoff. I think, you know, even though we don't know how good he is, we can probably all settle on the likelihood that his last was too bad to be believed. Yes. And you probably are supposed to give him one more shot just for that reason. I couldn't imagine using him pretty extensively in a multi-race play, but I could see maybe throwing him into a, a try or super and letting him have a, a somewhat prominent spot. You know, one horse that I think is not really getting much conversation, not that he necessarily deserves it, but... They, they bought Belgrade off of a maiden win at Fairgrounds, and he came back in a slow-paced seven furlong race and grinded out a win by a head. This horse looks too slow, right? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of my thought, and I'm always – I guess it's, it's a double-edged sword because I'm always of the opinion that if you like a horse based on tape – and they're going to be 15, 20, 30 to one. There's nothing wrong with taking a shot. It's a different story if you're talking about a horse that's going to be bet off the board. And I just don't really see a scenario in which Belgrade takes too much money. If he does, I suppose you can look at that and say, maybe there's some signal there and people love the horse. But to your point, I mean, through two starts, he's done nothing wrong, but he's not particularly fast. And again, against a horse like Classic Causeway, who maybe he's not a burner, you know, as far as what the clock says at this point, by no means is he slow. I mean, he's a horse that I think very... I would say conservatively, he should get up into sort of the mid 90 range as far as buyers are concerned this week. If he doesn't, it's probably cause for pause. But I, I just have a hard time imagining a horse like Belgrade jumping up 20, 25 points in this race. I agree. I will admit when I saw that there were going to be 11 rivals for Classic Causeway, I thought there would be a lot more competition. But that also says a lot about him. So he looks like a deserving heavy, heavy favorite. See how the big beat plays out. Another step on the way to the first Saturday in May. The last race that Matt and I are going to look at is the Grade Two Azari, which goes as race number nine at Oaklawn Park, a post time of six ten Eastern time. And you know, Matt, this is a race where it brings together a couple of horses that, in, in their own ways, have been very impressive. Um, and we're talking about, of course, CC, who won the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint last year, and the you know the kind of classy and consistent she dares the devil who we're surprised to see back as a five-year-old. Nice to have her still in the mix. And Brad Cox has obviously been well represented in this division in the past. The one thing I can tell you is that uh, I don't think CC is going to be three to one in this race. I, I would imagine that coming off consecutive hundred plus buyer speed figures and a Breeders' Cup win two back, I would imagine she'll be more like eight to five. And look, she she exudes quality. I guess I've just never liked her going two turns. And I know she has one going two turns. She's one at Oaklawn going two turns. I just don't really look at her and think, even though this is only a mile and a 16th, I just don't love her stretching out to a route of ground. I think she is what she is. A really nice crack seven eights kind of filly. And it's unfortunate that maybe some of those opportunities are, are few and far between this time of year, at least until we get to Churchill for the distaff there. Uh, but the idea of, taking her at a short number in a field like this, where I think not even including she dares the devil. I think there are other Phillies that you can make cases for uh, specifically. I I'm intrigued by Pauline's Pearl. If maybe that run in the Houston ladies classic, and you saw it firsthand, if that was the starting off yeah. point where maybe she can take another step forward and can continue along. I didn't love her last year. I thought she was just kind of a grinder and by no means was she visually, you know, spectacular down the lane, but she did draw away in that run down at Sam Houston. So I, I think, 
there's a scenario in which I could I could see she moves forward off that. If she gets up into that sort of high 90 range, she's at least right there close to CC, especially if I think she may take a slight step backward going two turns compared to the one turn configuration. And you brought up she dares the devil. I mean, she's just rock solid. She loves Oak Lawn Park. I love the versatility. And, and kind of in hindsight, I actually think you can make a case she ran one of the best races in the distaff, given how close she was to the pace. I'm not saying she was up on it, but they went off the charts fast. And for her to finish sixth yeah. in that spot, I actually think it was a pretty commendable effort. Um, I, I think in many ways, she's probably the most likely winner, even more so than CeCe. But from a gambling standpoint, I'd be lying if I said Pauline's Pearl didn't uh, pique my interest. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And, and I'd say interesting that she dares the devil is that while her distaff was probably her best race as, as a whole in 2021, and I know some people would automatically say, how could it be her best race if she ran sixth? Taking the whole thing into context, I think she ran extremely well, just like you just said. But, you know, other than that, her best race was her first off the layoff Oaklawn race in this race last year. And, and I mean, everybody remembering back to that, she actually went out and got the lead on Latruska, dictated terms to her, and was able to hold her off in a really game and really gritty performance the problem to me is that I felt like prior to the Breeders' Cup, she was tailing off a little bit, you know, and it wasn't as if she was was really struggling. Um, she was just not quite as good as she had been before. So I, I would say that I'm interested to see where she lands. You know, I, honestly, I'm, I'm always glad to see these older female horses come back. Um, I, I was actually very surprised to see CC come back. I wonder as well on the placement here, and, and I'm with you, obviously, on her being a one-run, one-turn horse. Um, I wonder if Michael McCarthy is giving himself the option of figuring out whether he wants to cut her back for the Derby City Distaff, or if this goes well, maybe she gets another shot in the Apple Blossom. And, you know, they're just grade wanting, I would imagine, with her six old they all have the option of figuring out in pretty short order if she's maybe not quite good. The Monica gives no indication she's not quite as good as she was. It was a really strong effort to finish second behind Merneath, who got everything her way pace-wise. Uh, obviously, a part of me is, is going to root for Pauline's Pearl without question. The one thing I'll say about Pauline's Pearl is that she was a lot handier last time, and I think that's a really good sign. I think one of the things that she struggled with going long was that she she had the ability to stay close, but she just couldn't finish. And, you know, Steve Asmussen is so good with these kind of horses year to year. And so I'm hopeful. Obviously, the Houston Ladies Classic has been incredibly productive in terms of this race and the Apple Blossom, three Apple Blossom winners in the last five runnings of the Houston Ladies Classic. Would love to see Pauline's Pearl take that kind of step forward. And her work tab looks very good. So I'm intrigued. And I think she's clearly the the first alternative. Now, you have the question with a horse like Lady Mystify, who traded uh, – Decisions, Pauline. Well, granted, a considerably lesser competition. She is obviously a filly who needs Lasix, and she's getting Lasix because in this is another graded stake race where you can run on Lasix. And so, but I, I still think she's a cut below. Did you feel similarly? Yeah, and also I just don't love the way the race could set up for her. I mean, I feel like yeah. she's going to be under siege from the moment they break from the gate. She's going to have she dares the devil breathing down her neck. She'll probably have Super Quick, who I don't think is quite good enough to, to win in a race like this, but she can certainly kind of play spoiler to a horse like Lady Mystify. I just did, I didn't love the dynamics of it. And to your point, you take a look at her runs without Lasix. Granted, I'm not going to, you know, the, the career debut, it is what it is. But that run in the Tory Pines, I mean, she stopped badly in that spot. So I, I just, it's a combination of things that... Yeah, a combination of things. I just I don't love the fact that she's going to have to take heat every step of the way. And I think there are other more talented fillies in the race. Totally agree. That caps the Azeri for us. A really interesting showdown between Cece and She Dares the Devil. Maybe not the greatest betting race, but definitely a fun race for all of the fans without question. Matt, thanks so much for joining me. That's our stakes roundtable for this Friday. I will admit, I'll preview everybody. I'll let you know now. I'm going to be back next week, too. So we're going to have to find some races to discuss then. I'm sure we'll be able to discuss that. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you next week, buddy. For all the best in harness action, including specific focal points like the Woodbine Mohawk meet on Friday and Saturday nights, take a look at First Over with Edison Hatter. He takes a look at the pick five in those podcasts and has a ton of great content on the harness front. Make sure you're listening to First Over with Edison Hatter. And next up on the In The Money Players podcast, going to head out west and take a look at the Golden Hour Pick 4. Joining us to do that, our friend Gino Bacola. Gino, great to have you. I'm sure you're excited, as I am, about this uh, set of races on Saturday afternoon. 
I always love it. I love the, some of these uh, cross track promotions too, where we're going to go from Santa Anita, we're going to go to Golden Gate. So we get a little SoCal, NoCal action. I love the low takeout, the dollar based minimum. That's what the, one of the things I love about Sam Houston out there. They still do that with the pick threes, that dollar base. So you get a nice payout and the, the low takeout is something I'm always going to focus in on. So anytime we get an opportunity, I'm uh, happy to, to join you and talk a little SoCal racing and uh, some NoCal in the mix this weekend too. No question. We'll definitely have some Sam Houston conversation a little later with Jessica Paquette. But let's get in to this golden hour pick four sequence, which begins in race number eight with a six furlong 12-5 claimer bread and butter types. How are we going to get this thing started? Yeah, I'm going to go three deep, I think, to, to kick off this first leg of the pick four sequence. Uh, I do think that the five busy painter is probably the one to, to catch in here. This is a six-year-old mare who's very quick. She got the lead inside last time out from the rail. And I love when horses move from the inside towards the middle to the outside because they're not going to be forced quite as much so I think she's probably the one they'll have to run down she was behind a horse uh, that we're going to see in a couple of horses running lines that popped up a horse named um, uh, an undefeated one uh, most recently that we're going to see I think in a few different ones so busy painter coming out of a, a very good productive race now the price race the price horse in here for me Nick might be to the outside with Cholima I think we can eliminate some of those races going a little bit longer toss the turf the last two sprint races were wins at five and a half and at six and a half um, the last six sprint races are all top three finishes for Cholima you look a, a couple starts back right into a horse named bye bye birdie the last five races for five bye bye birdie you have a win in a first level allowance you beat a horse named Miraz you beat another horse named Stella New are those are stakes company like those are legitimate stakes horses just to give you an idea of how that stacked up then three straight allowance starter wins at the 25 level so i think cholima is actually coming out of some sneaky races i'll end up going three deep in here five eight and then the seven take a leap just a total strong connections play here a horse who's turning back so probably three deep for me to try to get out of this first leg yeah, I will admit I'm a sucker for cutbacks. And uh, Chalima, who you're mentioning, of course, shortening up from the couple of mile starts, taking the big class drop as well. And, you know, these are the kind of cutbacks that I love, too, because this is a horse who's been an effective sprinter. Right. Yep. It's not as if it's just a, a dyed in the wool router that hasn't no. really had a lot of opportunity sprinting. This this mare looks like she is better going a shorter distance. I think the tricky thing about these golden hour sequences are those races at Golden Gate. And of course, yeah. the racing is very competitive up on the Tapita, but it's not as popular necessarily. The first of the two races in the golden hour pick four at Golden Gate will go in order is uh, race number eight. It's a one other than allowance race at a mile and a 16th on the synthetic surface. Where did you land here? Um, I'm probably going to use three or four in here. I thought the three Gia has some really nice races uh, at Woodbine on the synthetic that you can go back and take a look at uh, a couple starts uh, before. So you see races at Woodbine that are pretty competitive. Look at those last three races, the races in October, November, December. Um, might be a cut below just based on like numbers and figures, but she should get a really nice pace set up in here. Second start off the bench, second time for the new connection. So uh, Gia, I will include. I thought towards the outside, uh, the seven horse would be a little bit interesting in here. Shira Linda, who drew the rail in the last two and three of the last four races, now is going to move from the inside to the outside, was asked for some speed, was able to get off the rail to the two path to press, but just was no match for the winner that day. And actually sort of, I think might've been second best, kind of loomed up and ended up fading. The five's another one, Rev Re. Just the way this race shapes up on paper, Nick, I thought there might be a good amount of pace. Uh, Lagatha with some speed on the stretch out. Trojan clubhouse fight on. March Madness going on right now. My Trojans just got a, a nice late night victory uh, right before you and I recording this. So a uh, shout out there. And uh, so I'm looking for horses that are might be pressing, sitting a little bit in here with the likelihood of a couple speeds to set it up. I end up going three, seven, five, four, the horses who I want to try to get out of this second leg. Yeah, it, it definitely looks like a competitive race when I mean, you're talking about a morning line favorite at or around three to one. I thought that uh, that Lagatha, who you mentioned, was a little interesting, maybe being the inside speed. Tough to yep. say if that's necessarily that much of a big thing. Reverie looks like a deserving favorite. Yep. I didn't have really anything interesting to add to that uh, bit of analysis. I think you covered the main players. We'll go back to Santa Anita for leg number three which is the San Luis Ray and has become customary in a lot of different places around the country. The featured event is the last yeah. race of the day. This is at a mile and a half. We're going to go partially down the hill. I remember, this is the old Breeders' Cup turf route from a lot of, uh, of instances at Santa Anita. And I will admit, Gino, I am a, I'm a big say the word fanboy. He's going to be the likely favorite in here. But uh, he was he was one of the biggest bedbacks I think I've ever 
even made a mental note of or a physical note of off of that uh, Delmar handicap. And, and I will admit I got my share of him. He doesn't owe me anything. I got my and share of him, the Delmar handicap or in the Hollywood turf cup next time out. That's what I think is, is difficult about trying to beat him in this spot is because the way that race shaped up acclimate was loose on the lead. It's like the template that you might look at if you're trying to beat, say the word in here and you go, Oh, okay. Maybe acclimate gets loose on the lead, but he did that day and say the word ran him down with relative ease, honestly. And he should be able to save all the ground in here. He, you know, you go through his form, his poor performances are days when he has legit trouble or is just in a little bit too tough with like, like top tier, classy, classy horses. I think he's a standout in here. Honestly, um, he just missed second on January the 3rd. So that race is a little bit sneaky because Friars Row just kind of got a nice trip, got the jump on him, and he sort of was a little bit behind. And once he got going, he got up and he got there late. I think he saves all the ground. I think Flavian Pratt, who we found out is going to be leaving Southern California not too long, I think he probably wants to get as many nice wins as he can Well, with all these live mounts before. Things will probably get a little difficult when you move away, you know, for a little bit before you really start picking things up. So right now, take advantage, say the word. I'd love to try to get creative. The problem is, is he, to me, just feels like a real standout. And if I was, I, I, I think I'd be taking shots. Like if you're looking for a price, the horse, the, the nine awfully naughty, I like, I just feel like more of an underneath, like distance won't be a problem for him, but they all to me feel a cut below. So I'm not going to get too cute. I'm just going to single say the word in here. Yeah, I mean, I, I really feel like the alternatives would only be acclimate or award winner, and they almost cancel each other out. Yeah, I don't know if they're not pricey or enough or... either. I'd, I'd no. want a little bit more on them than just maybe what your second or third choice might end up being there. So I, I don't really want to go ABC and end up doubling or tripling up a ticket where I'd rather hit this honestly and punch it twice, um, like as being a say the word fan, than maybe use a couple others in here. Yeah, I agree. I mean, current was claimed three starts back for 40,000. Hard to believe that he's going to go up the class ladder that quickly. I think the other thing worth noting about say the word and not that we need to spend a significant amount of time talking about an eight to five shot is he feels like a true mile and a half horse. Like yep. this is really his game. Uh, this, if not a little bit longer, six for six lifetime in the money, including three victories. Let's close out the sequence back at Golden Gate. We'll head up north. This is a five and a half furlong, one other than allowance race. A couple of good races for the Golden Gate offering. Yeah. Pretty, I thought this was a pretty wide open and contentious field. I agree. I think you have a couple opportunities for prices in here. Uh, now, the six Revolution is the horse to beat, the one they'll all have to hold off. But it, he, while he's while she has performed well at five and a half with her running style, it does sort of leave her uh, up against it sometimes at this distance. She will need a little bit of pace up front. There are two other horses who I think are interesting. If I single say the word, I can use a couple others in here. The five Doggy Dreams is one that I definitely want to have on my ticket. Doggy Dreams had not raced from May of 2020 to January of 2022. So a long layoff. We're talking about a year and a half here and showed up in that race in January and ran really well on January the 23rd, um, settled fifth, but settled is probably not the right word. Tried to fit, tried to get a spot in fifth, but the horse was kind of rank and wanted to go. Hadn't run in a while. So was fresh, was eager. And once they were able to relax a little bit, made a really nice like four wide bid at the top of the lane was a clear cut second that day. If you use the, the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh's girl as sort of a measuring stick for the rest of this field. That's a horse who's beat up on a lot of these doggy dreams was not all that far behind that one. Doggy dreams came right back on February the 13th and was really nice that day. Again, like a little bit of a step slow inside was behind horses kind of got shuffled a little bit and then moved to the two path in between angled around three wide visually very impressive. Now you'll go third start off the layoff, you know, third start of the form cycle, uh, third start for the new barn. I feel like the five can continue to improve in here. So I'll use the five doggy dreams along with revolution. And then the speed I think might come from the four Atlantic strike. Another one who I think based on the pattern of recent form should, you know, step forward really nicely in this race. Atlantic strike is really quick on um, that January 29th race. There've already been two next out winners. That was a horse I was talking about a little bit earlier, Becca Taylor, who we referenced in the first leg of the sequence. Becca Taylor is six for six undefeated, a multiple stakes winner. And the fourth place finisher in that race came back to win a 25 claimer next out Atlantic strike cleared off, just held on for third. It was exactly the kind of race that you would have expected from a horse who hadn't raced from May to January, probably needed the race, flashed some speed faded. Now she's got some bottom. Both of her wins are going five and a half on the synthetic at golden gate. I think she's in a great spot. I end up going four five, six in here. 
I like it. The only other horse I would have mentioned would have probably been the eight perfect stories. He's probably more of an underneath type than a real win candidate yeah. coming back off the layoff. Did take a big step forward in the two turf races before going to the sidelines. This is a pretty tough assignment off the bench, admittedly, but this is a horse who I think uh, – it ran some decent races sprinting, but otherwise I think you've got all the main players. That caps a really good golden hour yeah. pick four sequence. Gino, really appreciate you coming on to join us. We'll have to make it a more regular thing, my friend. I appreciate and it. Anytime you need, and I want to get you uh, joining me on That's What G Said in a few weeks for the big Sam Houston weekend so we can promote them and talk about all those races. Absolutely. Can't wait. Look forward to it. Good luck, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Make sure you're subscribing to the In The Money Media Newsletter. ton of great information there on a weekly basis. A lot of specific things like In The Money Plus content, as well as regular updates on podcasts and everything else going on at the network. Very excited to have all of our new In The Money Plus subscribers who recently enjoyed a free trial. We are going to have a ton of great content throughout Derby season. Looking forward to another Derby prep recap that's likely to be recorded with PTF and myself in the next couple of weeks getting us on the way to the first Saturday in May. Make sure you are subscribing to the In The Money Media newsletter. And now to close out the show, we have a look at the Sam Houston Race Park Pick 6 sequence for Saturday night. She's becoming a regular. In fact, she is a regular on the In The Money Media. And Jessica Buck is going to go over the sequence with Jessica. How are you doing? I'm great, Nick. How about you? Happy, happy Friday. Looking forward to a great weekend of racing. No doubt about it. Can't complain. And of course, it's not just a good day of racing. It ends up being a good night of racing as well at Sam Houston Race Park with this pick six sequence that starts in race number four. We're taping this on Friday, of course, and there is a carryover in the pick six tonight. Fingers crossed for some decent weather. It's really one of the better cards of the entire meet. Well, we're going to focus our attention on Saturday night's races. And the Space City pick six begins in race number four at a mile and a 16th on the turf. We are at 18 feet on the turf course. And, you know, this looks like a fun and competitive race to me. How do you think we can get it started? Well, I, when I was handicapping this race, I know you can often pick the horses that I am going to select when I'm handicapping. Um, I'm sure you went with your friend Mujab Jr. here, right? I actually didn't. I, I'm, I'm You're giving disloyal. Me, I, I'm disloyal. I've, I've, you know, Mujab looks like he's gotten a little too, a little too pokey for me, and it's not a great sign to see him in for the tag. Oh, God, he's going to win to prove you wrong here. I actually looked elsewhere as well. I like Fred's Twirling Candy. I think he's live at a bit of a price for Ronnie Cravens. Ernesto Valdez Jimenez, I've been saying this all season, underrated on the turf. Every time I see a horse win at a big price on the turf, I then check who was on him. It's Ernesto. This horse's recent form has been pretty encouraging. I don't think he had the best trip last time out. One of those neat, hard-knocking veterans. This is, this is the best race on the card as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no doubt about it. I agree. I thought uh, I thought he was a contender for sure. I ended up picking Metropole, who I know is moving up in class pretty significantly. But uh, I thought he ran great last time. I know Uncle Artie and Drive Happy not quite on the the same playing field as some of the horses in here, but there wasn't much pace in front of him that night. And he, I thought he ran very well to sort of grind them all down and end up winning going away. Different horse on turf in general, and Jaime Castellanos, who I think does a good job, been a little unlucky, he's had a lot in the money just but only win the one from Metropole. I think he can definitely pick up his second win of the meet. You referenced Mujab Jr., who I've picked left and right against much better competition. You wonder why wouldn't you take him today? He's he's not going to get enough pace to run at number one. That's my biggest concern. And uh, and he's just been a little, little slower in his first two starts early of 2022, and that's what has me a little bit nervous. But I will admit, even through the binoculars, when I am objective, if he is in contention, I will be rooting for Mujab Jr., the venerable Texas bred who continues to campaign even at his advanced age. Let's go on to race five, which will kick off the pick five. Of course, all multi-race bets at Sam Houston Race Park offered with a 12% takeout. We're going to see how smart I was on the morning line here, Jessica. I made Mas Massard two to one. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I, I really love the morning line price of 15 to one on redefinition. If I can get anything close to that, I'll be quite pleased. I thought he had an encouraging debut as a two-year-old at Churchill on the sideline until February. Obviously, you know, sometimes when you push these horses so early to get to the races in April as two-year-olds, there are some consequences to that. And then they need to go to the sidelines and recalibrate. Have to think this is a horse that needed one. Uh, the 15 to one morning line, I think is really generous. If you can get that Stuart Elliott aboard, this horse is also a full to freedom flyer stakes place. So a little bit of back class in the pedigree as well. To your point, to Massard, I think he's very legitimate at two to one. Um, Nyquist has been a much more precocious sire than I anticipated. I did not really think they'd be running as early in their careers as they are. And I've liked everything I've seen from them. Yeah, the horse worked nine and four at, at OBS last March. 
uh, March of 2021. And the dam is a New York bread steak winner. The work tab looks good. You know, the biggest question becomes why is Ron Moquette sending this horse to Sam Houston when he had her at Oaklawn where the purses for maiden special weight races are roughly $50,000 more um, could be that he wants a little bit softer spot. And I will admit that he caught a pretty weak spot I think, from top to bottom. Pretty pretty standard, though, for a maiden special weight is Sam Houston. The interesting thing about the Asmussen pair, and you were discussing redefinition, is that uh, Seward Elliott sticks with redefinition. And and I, I think in, in many cases, the Asmussen barn makes these decisions. Rudy Guerra is getting on sense of excellence who comes down from New York and Kentucky. And of course, those running lines, even though they're not great because they came at, at a, his debut came at a place like Aqueduct, he's going to get, she's going to get a decent amount of support. Um, but as you pointed out, 15 to one, probably a tad generous. It's really all going to depend on how much support some of these first time starters get, including Nordic Queen, who goes out for, uh, to me, the very underrated barn of Francisco Bravo and uh, has some decent, a decent pedigree as well. So it, it is a pretty, pretty competitive race. I even thought she's a bossy girl ran pretty well on debut behind speed who came back and looked great in her first try against winners, but uh, we'll definitely have to improve off of that recent turf effort. The third leg of the Space City Pick 6 is a five furlong maiden special weight turf event. I know you like to take a swing against favorites when you have an opportunity, but Bedouin Fighter looks awfully tough in this spot. My notes on that horse are sure, I guess. Um <laughs> One of my handy, the way I handicap races, here's a little glimpse behind the madness. I'll go through each horse in the race and just write my first impression upon looking at them down. And then I go back and make actual thoughts. So sometimes my first impressions are not very nice. Sometimes my notes are very not for the public eye, but this was a sure, I guess. No, this horse has shown that he does not want to win. Eight starts has hit the board four times. Maybe he beats me here. I'm going to pass. Uh, I like number four wheels. The turf experiment, I think, was a good one. Out of a more than ready mare, the tur try, tur try on the turf made sense. Third behind Hooves Your Daddy, who did Hooves Your Daddy run last night? or Last night, right? Not scratched, yeah. And scra okay, scratched. So no, I was hoping to use that as an indication. Uh, but again, wheels, good effort. I also like Brahms Boy, kind of an interesting long shot. First time Lasix. Turf moved him up last time. Brahms, you know, throws some horses that can really take to the turf. And I'm trying to beat the favorite here. Yeah, I don't blame you. I, I I would have probably included a horse like Stasis, who's coming back off a layoff. Um, Going to have to really hustle at 5 eighths though, but did work very quickly here uh, roughly eight days ago. Um, the other one that, that you mentioned, uh, who I thought was, was very prominent in terms of, of potentially upsetting his wheels. Uh, yeah, I, I liked the turf debut as well. And, you know, I, I don't I don't love Bedouin Fighter. I just feel like it might be the right place at the right time. I don't blame anyone for trying to take a little swing against. Let's go to race number seven at a mile on the main track. This is a one other than for fillies and mares, three-year-old and up. And where did you land here, Jess? I went with the seven, a girl like me. Uh, looking at the company this horse has been keeping, if you look a couple of starts back, she was second behind Lavender, who's really ambitiously spotted, but she's in the Azari Stakes this weekend, um, which, again, just a bold, bold move. Um, intro, but a nice horse, and this horse has been keeping good company. She's going to be a single for me. I don't love her, but I really don't – I didn't like anyone else to beat her either. Yeah, you know, and, and maybe I'm being a little too clever, and maybe it's not necessarily the right setup. I picked a girl like me second, which it seems like a girl like me is pretty fond of running second. Um, I picked Set the Pace, and so my thought on Set the Pace was that my notes from February 5th was that it, it looked like a decent inside, and I didn't do all the work on the head-ons to, to make be sure of that, but it was also her first start off a lengthy layoff. She likely needed it. She now comes back stretching out, and her two mile races, I know they were against State Breads last year at Lone Star. They were very, very good, and... If she can somehow, and we'll see, Elaine Luzzi did this last night with uh, Durango Jess late on the card. The two other speed horses are on both sides of her. And so, you know, so many times with this relatively short run to the first turn, the horse who ends up getting the lead, it's decided in the first two or three strides out of the right. gate. And so Lane's a really good gate rider. I'm he hoping is that, sharp. that yeah, he's very good. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's a, real, that a real cerebral rider, and you yeah. can you can really see you can really see the strategy in how he how he chooses his place. Yeah, and I think he's going to come out with intent. And if she wins the race to the first turn, I'm hoping that that's kind of all she wrote. I liked a girl like me last time. Uh, coming off the turn, I really thought she was going to be able to run them down, and she ended up coming up short. That's okay. I, I think she still is a, is a every bit of a major player in this spot. I would use those two, and that's it in any kind of multi-race play. The eighth race is a bread and butter for us down here, a $15,000 claiming event going a mile on the turf course. 
and it's a relatively bulky field. I went all the way to the outside to the 11 Seductive USA, and anybody who's listening who maybe hasn't been watching, uh, the barn of Cesar Govea has five wins in the last two racing weeks, including one at 8-1 to one last night. And in going back and watching this Son of El Kingdom's 2022 debut, it was his first start in roughly 18 months. Uh, he ran great. There was no setup in front of him at all. The one-two finishers were on the, the engine basically the whole way. They were close, and uh, and he made the only meaningful off-the-pace move, did so while extremely wide on the course. I thought he was going to get a much better setup this time around, and I promise I didn't make the morning line because I liked horse. Never. You would never. Never. You are, we are professionals here. I can separate myself from my own feelings. <laughs> Meanwhile, I then get hung up as a, as a fangirl about horses, and again, <laughs> sorry to bling, I will just keep picking you. Um, yeah, exactly. Where did you land here? I went with the three, Edsmosh, Karen Jacks, Ernesto Valdez Jimenez. Really respectable effort last time out. Showed speed, showed interest. Just came up short. That second start since November, I think he'll be a little bit sharper. This is a horse that clearly some things have not gone his way throughout his career. A couple of gaps, but there's back class there. I also really like number two, Attain Success. This horse is just so honest. Shows up every time and his tactical speed works to his advantage. Yeah, I totally agree. I thought he actually, uh, you know, didn't drop off at all form-wise last time out. First off, the claim by Dallas Keene. Dallas Keene, of course, a very good veteran trainer down in these parts, and he has the speed to stay close throughout. One thing that has played out pretty regularly on the Sam Houston turf course is that regardless of rail setting, being forwardly placed is an advantage. But it's a, it's a winter wintertime turf course. It tends to get a little bit more lush, and, uh, and I think that's why we see that. The nightcap is a seven furlong, three life claiming race. And I will say that I probably could steal your thunder by offering my pick, guessing on who yours, who yours might be. But Let's who do you see. like in the nightcap? Uh, I went with the four runaway, Tracy, fresh, fresh off a second win. I like a horse with momentum in these conditional claiming races. It's yep. easy to get stuck here. You can, you know, a horse that's coming in right off of that second win, go for the third, capitalize, strike while the iron's hot. I also like the seven secret whiny, kind of a bridesmaid role in the last three, but really knocking on the door. Yeah, I like, I like Secret Blarney. Okay. Um, and so my angle on Secret Blarney is that, again, uh, on February 24th, I had that as, as potentially a negative rail. Um, there were a couple of horses on that card. Gold and Silver was a maiden who was a favorite in one of the races earlier on in that program, and Secret Blarney. And they were kind of the two that I used really as the, the basis for it. They both dove to the inside and upper stretch and spun their wheels. And so I all of the winners on that card came three, four paths off the inside. It was a day where it was particularly cold as well. Um, mm -hmm. There was a little bit of rain in the air. Area. So I thought you could upgrade him. Now, of course, the problem is this is a horse who's eight for eight in the money at Sam Houston, but oh for eight on the win end. And yeah, so to yeah, gotta make him, that next step. Yeah, he he, he kind of seems to find somebody to uh, to to allow him to tow home. Um, but you know, I still think he's a horse with some talent and some ability. I think he'll get the right trip in here too. He's actually interestingly been in three really bulky fields where he's been positioned in different places early. He came from deep in the pack to run that uh, that good second place effort back in January and then has been much more handy in his last two starts, I would imagine that's where he'd be. I'm a big Kevin Scholl fan, so I have nothing against uh, Runaway Tracy at all. I actually picked her second, and I thought her last race, while it was against what looks like a weaker field top to bottom, Delirium came right back and won her next start. Sure. So I, I don't think it was as bad as, as the average two life. And looking at speed figures, this horse is actually right on par with some of the better horses here. I've always had kind of a, a thought that – and I think this plays out a lot when you have recent maiden claiming winners that are now in two life races. And I think a lot of times when you have two life claimers moving up to three life, a lot of times the two life races are just as good. There really oh, isn't a big it's drop. It's all off. interchangeable at a certain point. Right. And it, I think at that level, you either want to get through your conditions or you, or you don't. You're, you lost right. your best friend when you broke your maiden. It's. I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think a lot of times these horses are just, I mean, for lack of a better way to put it, they're proven losers. So, you know, they, they're trying to, they're trying to win. That's what, that's what counts. We all are. Exactly. Well, that is the Space City Pick 6 sequence for Saturday night at Sam Houston Race Park. Jessica is going to be down in Houston in a couple of weeks, and we're excited to have you. We're we're ordering up a lot of spring weather. It's supposed to be nice and warm next week. And If it's and, anything under 80, I'm going right home, and uh, that's it. That might be pushing it a tad, but I think we'll be all right, all things considered. Jessica, thank you so much for joining me. This has become a regular thing, and you can go ahead and pencil it in next week for another Sounds look good. at the Space City Pick 6 for next Saturday night. That's been the Space City Pick 6 for this evening, and that closes out our In the Money Players podcast. Big thank you 
to everybody who joined me, Gino Bacola, who looked at the Golden Hour pick four, Matt Bernier for the Stakes Roundtable, and Jessica Paquette for the Sam Houston Space City pick six. Big thanks to producer Craig, with whom we would not be able to do this show. Whether he gets enough credit from PTF is an issue between the two of them, because he's going to get plenty of credit from me. This has been another production of the In The Money Media Network. I don't have a clever catchphrase like Pete does, so I'm just going to sign off the way I generally do. Until next time, best of luck.